All right. Well, thank you very much, Jelani. Um, we're going to go through a summary of the tritium evolution from various experiments. You're going to see uh, things that are very similar to what you've already seen, okay, that we've done a, a number of times and uh, for years and years. Um, uh, and right now we're working with uh, Malcolm Fowler. I'm a bit jet lagged because uh, we got our uh, flights mixed up and, and we didn't get here until today. But um, as you can see, I, I was trying to practice this talk and uh, and my wife says I have a gift, so there you go. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go through this now. This was the first sort of the first the experiments that we did with the palladium powder and silicon powder, uh, and also whoops, now we're going backwards. Okay, now yeah, okay, back to this one where we have uh, palladium powder and tracks. Then we went to wires. Now the first wires we did were very thin wires, they were 100 micron wires. Those worked fine, but they didn't work very long. But the most interesting thing about it, them was after they uh, were pulsed for a certain period of time, they annealed. And so they went from a, a sort of a columnar structure in the wire to single crystals in the, in the wire. And then they broke, okay, due to the fact that palladium moves a lot. Uh, now, what we did lately, uh, was uh, palladium tape and nickel tape, and that's what you see here. Uh, they're a little more robust, and you can use an alloy of palladium and nickel, or any other alloy you want. Uh, the other thing that we've we've done in the past is a G75 powder. This is in a um, a pressure container, and what you have is just a little convection current, and then we were sniffing it for helium and tritium. Uh, tritium, okay, helium, not so much in this uh, particular uh, case. This is uh, work that we did to uh, look for tritium in the diffusion cell. So we have um, high, high voltage applied to this and uh, plasma on the front here and then we're diffusing through a uh, palladium membrane. That's really difficult because as you cycle that, you're gonna crack, and so we didn't do that very many times. Uh, finally, what we like and what we continue to use is this particular experiment here where we have a, a plasma sheath on whatever alloy or whatever metal we want. Now we can make uh, dozens of alloys, uh, and we can try different metals, and we've done that. And so the next couple of slides, you're gonna see the results from some of those, um, those alloys. Uh, and they all work to some degree. So let me move on. Uh, well, this is just a summary. I think Peter asked me one time, he said, you know, it seems like you used to get more tritium out of the powder than you got from anything else. And we really didn't when you normalize it in terms of picocuries per gram per hour because there was a lot of powder in those cells, okay. And then these uh, palladium powder tracks, a little bit less powder, because why? Powder is really expensive. And then we went to the palladium wires. Well, the, the wires were about a meter long, but they're difficult to make in alloys. So, and we are already knew uh, from doing these palladium wire cells that alloys were important because the uh, palladium purity in those cases uh, was directly related to the tritium output. So we tried the diffusion disk, that was kind of interesting, but it, it doesn't last too long. And then the plasma cells were the most spectacular outputs, and the G75's kind of medium. So G75, the driver is just heat convection. This is a fast discharge. This is a heating and discharge, and then there's the high power pulse cells. Uh, with this, we found that neutron to tritium ratio. So there's no, tr no neutrons in these, in these uh, systems. Uh, and uh, that's um, been the case ever since. We've had a, a very sensitive 20% neutron detector that we put on a lot of these things and we don't see any neutrons. You have to go into a tunnel to be able to see this with this kind of output. And in fact, we did that and that's where we got this result was with Steve Jones in his deep tunnel under Provo. So that was that. Um, I think uh, 
move on here. Okay, now this is an eye chart, but this is an important eye chart because what this tells you, and it really reinforces everything we're, we're talking about here in terms of nano alloys and, and metal alloys and things, is that there's a big variation in just palladium alloys. So, and the really bad thing about this is that this particular alloy up here, the palladium, rhodium, cobalt, boron alloy, was the most productive, but it's also the most complicated and has the most phases and also uh, we had three or four of those batches. They, they had different boron concentrations and the, as the boron concentration went up, the tritium output went down. And then you go down here, you've got all these other palladium alloys and you finally, you find some which don't have any output at all. Okay, they're just null. And I think everybody's come, you know, had that experience. My palladium's dead, right? Okay, well, maybe it was a little too impure or maybe it didn't have the right impurities. Over here, we have some metals and, you know, some of these metals were informed by uh, Rayola, uh, you know, operating at uh, tw uh, two kilovolts. Okay, what we're talking about here is, you know, uh, 10 EV, so we're down by a couple orders of magnitude in energy. Um, and some of the ones that he found to be active, we didn't, we didn't find to be active uh, or have a, uh, you know, any tritium action. So just to refresh your memory, here's the, oops, here's the, uh, uh, the metals. And so we're kind of concentrating on these. But a few of these were, were good for us, too. So there's a, there's a little anomaly there. Um, if we go to the, the samples, and these are the samples of palladium, rhodium, cobalt, boron. These are all those palladium, rhodium, cobalt, boron samples. And you can see there's some erosion. Okay, when we got the erosion, that's when we got the highest tritium output. So what's going on here? There's little tiny spots where all of the action was happening, probably, okay? And those would operate for tens of hours and then they'd eventually quit. So these may have been segregated areas that started up and uh, you would also see the blue, the blue green of the palladium ionization when those were uh, operating. You don't see that normally. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. You don't get this in any of the other samples, by the way. Uh, let's see. So this is just some microstructure from one of the uh, anodes. And you can see cracks. Ed loves these cracks. And some little fissures and holes from the anodes. Uh, you know, those are probably just uh, outgassing of the deuterium. And this is what the cathode looks like. The cathode's been um, eroded with these little uh, uh, pyramidal structures all over it. So this is pretty standard stuff for uh, plasma etching. Um, okay, so now this is where we get to see if we can make a movie. Okay, here we go. Look at this. First time this has happened. Um, that's the arcing. Now that's not the condition you want in this case. What this does, it generates copious amounts of uh, palladium uh, nanostructures or fuzz palladium particles. And in fact, I think Johnson Matthey has a, a big facility to do this. Uh, this is what you want here. And this is the start of the plasma going up the wire, and then it steadies out. So it's arcing a little bit, and now it's just in this uh, steady state uh, condition where it's just like an electrochemical uh, system. You're putting that on. but in this case, you're putting uh, 15 kilowatts in and not six watts, but just pulsed. If we put it in DC, of course, this thing would go away. So we're going to go on. Uh, this is what some of the equipment looks like. It's a, uh, uh, you know, just a double-ended conflat flange with the glass. So you can see what the plasma is doing. And then the current and the voltage are pulsed. So we're putting in a lot of uh, wattage, but it's at a constant power operation. In other words, we're adjusting 
this uh, voltage and current so that we get a constant power in so that we can measure the power, excess power. Now, uh, let's see. I don't think I want to, yeah, I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. Okay. This is what the tritium analysis system looks like. It's kind of grown like Topsy over the years. So, but it's basically just a loop with a uh, ion gauge over here, cell over here. Uh, and this is some of the data from that loop. Okay, so here's just a null sample. Then you pump it out. This is um, maybe an HD sample. You pump it out, then you come back and you get this. So there's no, no tritium effect here. These are the number of nanocuries or picocuries per liter. Here, this was run with the palladium rhodium cobalt sample and it's gone up and then you pump it out and then you put in the fresh gas and you see a delta. Okay, that means we generate a little bit of tritium in this system. Uh, now, one of the other ways to measure it, we don't like to just rely on one way to measure the tritium, okay? There's uh, ion gauges may have some drift and other things that could complicate the effect. So what we use is a liquid scintillation counter. This liquid scintillation counter is the Packard. We used this um, previously and now we've gone to a Beckman. So this is the new Beckman. Now, uh, all the results I'm going to show you were with the Packard. The Beckman we just put into operation and we found out it has a big problem uh, in our lab. And this is the problem. Okay, you may have this problem in your lab too. Okay, what's going on here? Does anybody know? Yeah, this is radon in the lab. And the Beckman, the Packard, I don't want to go into too many details, but the Packard was a little more sealed in the, uh, in the uh, scintillation counter area. The Beckman has got more um, ways for air to come in. So we have not been able to use this to its full advantage because I can only count down here. That's very small period of time right now, so I'm, I'm frustrated by that. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking this whole thing and we're enclosing it. So once you get a dead air space, you don't have a problem after three and a half hours. So that's, that's what you got to do. Um, now this is kind of interesting. This is um, tritium output as a function of D2 in H2. Uh, and we wanted to know what that was. And in this, for this, these were for some of the plasma samples. And what we're looking at is about 20%, 15 to 20% goes up. And then it goes back down. Um, I'm going to change gears a little bit. For that G75, we did a lot of runs with that G75 because it was pretty easy. And again, we got the, the highest output here at about 30%. Okay, now going back to the plasma, um, this is a scintillation count, and what we're seeing in this is we're counting the samples from the water recombination over a number of days, and we see it go up, and then we see it come back down. So there may be some uh, radioactive material in there that's then decaying, growing in and then decaying. Um, and we, we notice this on a number of samples. I just picked two because it's hard to do this. But I kept noticing this and noticing it. And normally, if you had some sort of artifact, it'd just be coming down like that. So it's very interesting that it went up. Um, now this is, what, what kind of gamma signature do you get out of these plasma systems? OK, well, this is just a background um, spectra for our gamma system. And when we subtract that, from a, an active sample, and this is uh, probably a nickel sample here, what you find is you find there's a cutoff around 200 kilovolts. So you don't see anything after about 200 kilovolts. And, and this is with that glass cell. So these are, these are very intense down here while it's running and then we're dropping off. It's probably Bremsstrahlung. As far as I'm concerned, it looks like it. And uh, that would be electrons. Uh, the other thing we're doing right now is we're trying to measure any post-radiation. And this is pretty difficult because you saw that one thing, it went up, it went down, well that was four days. 
Um, so what we're seeing right now is something that happens maybe uh, after you take the material out, you'll put it in this SSB counter and you'll look at it for um, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then everything's gone. Now, that's, that's the radon's a problem there because we can't, we, we see that radon out here if it's out here, but if it's not out here and we do it during a period of quiescent, we still get this sort of effect. But it's very low energy and I, I think we have to do more work. If we can find a sample that really goes off and they do vary, um, that would be a good thing. Uh, now, now I'm going to go into the calorimeter work. So this is a calorimeter built by Cool Essence. It's this little Seebeck calorimeter. Inside of here is a, uh, a system where we put the whole cell and then we pulse it and measure all the uh, various parameters, electrical parameters. And then you've got this uh, constant cooler down here. So that's your standard setup. So what do you see? Okay, well, remember I told you palladium wasn't always good. So here's a palladium 2% uh, silver alloy. This is the resistor calibration. And then we've got platinum, and we've got copper, and we've got nickel. So that's interesting, <laughs> you know? Would you expect copper and platinum to actually be, give you some excess heat, you know, at this uh, sort of thing? And would you expect this palladium sample to be zero or below zero? Well, here's the thing about that. Um, about that system, okay? The, you saw that glass uh, cell, okay? If you run it with just the glass in the calorimeter, you might expect that everything's gonna be picked up by the calorimeter, that's not so, okay? We're radiating, right? We've got a lot of uh, UV coming out. So if you surround that with a reflector, you're going to convert all that to uh, some heat that will then be um, caught by the air and then eventually into the calorimeter. So what, what this does is it takes this nickel conetic down here, which would be down here, if we didn't have that converter, and flips it up here. It's a big effect. This is um, 400 milliwatts out of about six watts. And everything does that except the resistor. The resistor moves around a little bit, but it not very much. So that's, uh, so if you don't convert it, you're not gonna get any excess heat in this system if, unless you have the, uh, a stainless steel vessel. So that's, uh, that's the, oh, and the other little thing is that somebody mentioned this, how long does this go on for? Well, there's actually a slope here, and if I go ahead and extend it out, it's 600 hours, okay, before it comes back to zero. So, yeah, okay, yeah, you, you set me up, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, but this just, what this means is that we started the calorimeter over here and it's not in equilibrium and finally it gets to equilibrium. So here's the resistor, it comes down and then it's in equilibrium. And so this is the heat, okay, and, and we're just, no heat in the resistor. Why, why is there so much noise in these other ones? Okay, it's a plasma, it's a plasma, okay. The, Take the question later. Okay, thank you. Okay. So it's a plasma and it, it, they're noisy. All right. So one of the, you know, we were talking about, well, we need to correlate the fem to tech with the uh, scintillation counter. Well, maybe we need to cal uh, correlate this uh, calorimeter with another method. So the other method we we're thinking about using is just pressure. So here's the pressure inside of the cell and it goes up. This is with a resistor, it goes up and then you turn it off and it goes back down. And of course it doesn't come back to zero because the resistor is out gassing, so we have to fix that. And then this is one where we've, um, we're just going along here uh, with a resistor and with a palladium composite, and then we look at it coming down. And there seems to be a little bit of a tail here, but we're gonna, we're gonna have, we just started this, so we're gonna have to look at it. Um, and, you know, there, that would be the other way to, to um, correlate uh, the output with heat. Now, 
The ultimate is to measure helium if you think this is being generated by helium. So back in the day, uh, we had the LANL look at some of the helium results. Um, and we have D2, H2, and the plasma run. This was a nickel, nickel run. And this is what we got. So for the, the D2 and the H2, we've got basically no uh, helium in there, helium-4. And for the plasma run, we had something, but we had a large error. Now we built a system, and Malcolm's going to talk about that today or tomorrow, I don't know which, um, and we've run a palladium rhodium cobalt uh, sample, and we seem to have 200 ppb until we run this like three or four more times. I won't believe it, but that's what we got. And um, we're gettering, they, uh, Lano, they were gettering these with a uh, ST707 getter, and now we're using activated carbon, and uh, you'll see the uh, the systems much uh, more sensitive than the um, uh, Finnegan that uh, we were using at the lab. So I'm wrapping this up right now. Um, we have these conclusions here, and one of the things that we like about this experiment is it only takes one to two days to do, so it's quick, so you can get a lot of data. Okay. Also, we like the nickel samples, okay. And um, the excess heat, that was about 5%, but is it gonna be consistent with the helium data? We have to, we'll have to take more data. And um, uh, if we can see any post-activation, then that might serve as a quick demo. Um, yeah, we're doing this right now with pressure. And of course, there's, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, there's a ton of parameters that we need to go through. And then, of course, um, we're, everybody's looking for the magic material that will work. And that's, that's I think, what, uh, what the goal is here, is uh, materials uh, fabrication. So we've got some acknowledgments uh, industrial heats supporting us right now but we've been supported by cool essence uh, new mexico small business Asso association and the lanol r and d uh, program now i got one more slide okay just one more okay now because somebody put up a a graph and it showed some things okay and this this blob here is sodium sulfur potassium, uh, silicon, and uh, just about everything else you can think of, okay? The, the only bad thing about it is it's not radioactive, or it might be good, but it, it's not radioactive. And what we did with this, this is a, a Roger Stringham uh, teaser, okay? Roger's been doing this, and we, we worked with him on this, so I'm, I'm gonna show you this, but I'm not gonna tell you exactly how he did it. Uh, and this is a palladium substrate here. So this stuff showed up, it was stuck on the middle of the foil. We wiped it off and there's a hole right here. You can see that hole. There's a bunch of little holes down here where nothing was on. But if you analyze the same thing, you've got inside of the hole the same stuff on here, basically that you saw in that uh, last uh, EDS. So the, the bad thing about it is, you know, a, a skeptic would say, Oh, you just concentrated all the junk that was in your system. But this is in D2O, just pure D2O. Um, and uh, the other little interesting feature is this. This is a nickel sample. And what do you see here? You see nickel balls. These are tiny little nickel balls. And there's a swath, a veritable highway of nickel balls. This is like... Um, you know, a couple hundred microns uh, across, and then there's, it's like 10 millimeters long, okay? So there's a lot of nickel here. Well, nickel, of course, you know, it's hard to melt. It's also very, uh, very hard to do this in D2O, which this was done in. So this is pretty anomalous. Well, that's what the title of this conference is. It's anomalous. <laughs> so so we've, we've got that. And um, I think we'll, we'll show more of uh, this sort of thing uh, later. But uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you.